Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the project space here at Milton Keynes Gallery. And thank you very much to the gallery, gallery for uh, letting us uh, in for this is, I think, number four in the Talking Shop series of talks uh, as part of IF 2014. I'm Bill G. I'm the creative director uh, for IF, uh, and it's great with this talk because we've got an independent chair, so I, I don't have to be part of the panel. I can be in the audience uh, asking questions. Um, sound is really important. Um, as I think most people know IF is a project of the stables, uh, and the stables' uh, core charitable uh, aim is uh, the promotion of uh, education and learning and appreciation around sound and music and the arts. And so we always look at how sound and music can filter through and feature within the programme of the different IFs. So we've done significant commissions, each of the editions uh, around sound and music. And we're very pleased in, in this uh, festival to be able to commission Kath Matthews uh, with the Canal and River Trust to create log shift songs. And we're very pleased that we've been able to present uh, Rayleigh's chorus for the last two days and currently it's on as we speak. Um, we work with another partner. Uh, one of our other partners is the Open University, who have come in and supported the actual presentations of uh, three days of chorus across the city, for which we thank them hugely. Um, but also, we have one sort of focus talk within the Talking Shop series. Uh, and, and that is also supported by the Open University and we've been working with the Open University to create a, a panel of people that will uh, uh, enliven, uh, enrich uh, and hopefully entertain us over the next uh, hour or so. Uh, and I think with that I will just hand over to uh, the chair from the Open University, Professor Anne Cochrane. Thank you. Hi, it's a great privilege for me to be here and to be doing this. It's uh, actually very exciting. I think um, when I was first asked to do this, I think the thing that attracted me was the thing was the title "One Person's Noise Is Another Person's Music," which I thought was a reference to my uh, musical tastes. Not everybody likes uh, avant-garde jazz from the 1960s. Um, I've discovered. Um, but actually I discovered also that this was actually a rather more exciting and forward-looking uh, way of engaging uh, uh, with the sonic art rather than any of, the, uh, any, of the, any of the more obscure things I was concerned with and actually very engaging and exciting. So, with no further ado, because I think this is really about other people, not about me, um, and because I think it's also about allowing the people here to be able to talk a bit about um, what's, what's said and what they've seen as well, seen and heard as well. Um, so I'm going, to move, I'm going to move straight on, and we're going to be um, having presentations following the order that's in the, um, in the, in the programme. So first of all, Rayleigh. Thank you. As I speak right now, my chorus is singing away at the hub, surrounded by cafes, restaurants, flats. I think it's beautiful, but then I would, because I made it. But as I speak right now, there's probably some local resident on the phone to the council <laughs> complaining bitterly about this terrible noise outside their window. And fair enough. My music is another person's noise. So I'm going to talk briefly about a few of my projects and in particular how I feel that location can change an audience's response and perhaps response to the work and perhaps change the way they listen. So this is a work called Swing. First did it 20 years ago. See some of these images are from when I did it 19 years ago, courtesy of Bill G. Um, situated in a former electricity generating station. And uh, this was the first time I realized the effect that taking an audience into an unusual venue could uh, change their relationship with the work. Susan Bennett, in a book called Theatre Audiences, um, says that theatre audiences tend to enter a social contract 
with the artwork, agreeing to be passive. So I'm interested in what happens when you take people outside, what happens when you disrupt these conventions and take people outside of their comfort zone. So what I try and do in some of the work is explore the safe relationship between audience and the artwork. And by taking the audience outside of their normal expectations, perhaps their engagement with the work can be intensified. So this is Hangar 3022 at Upper Hayford in North Oxfordshire, a former F-111 fighter jet hangar. Um, I did a work here called Siren. For the audience, um, this was clearly outside of the normal conventions of attending an art gallery or concert. Once they were through the razor wire checkpoint, they had to drive for two miles into the heart of this ex-Cold War territory. When they went inside the hangar, okay, it's just a sound artwork, but this hangar filled with rotating sound machines um, enables for me a certain suspension of disbelief. The authenticity of the location enables a certain suspension of disbelief so that the audience can more easily enter into the work. One of my techniques is to try and immerse the audience in an experience so that they forget that they are listening. Uh, this is a work called Cold Storage I did a couple of years ago, which is perhaps an extreme example of this, where I built a cryogenic tank, which was at freezing temperature, and I put people inside, well, I didn't personally, my assistant put people inside the tank, and they were kept in there for 10 minutes listening to something, whilst it was extremely cold. This is a work called the Ethometric Museum. This is a photograph of it at the Museum of History of Science in Oxford, which is the first time I did it. Here, what I was trying to do is engage the audience through the theatre of the work. So the wonder of these peculiar objects, ethometric instruments, instruments that I had in effect created, but instruments that look as though they belong to some forgotten part of the history of science. So that by immersing the audience in a narrative, they perhaps listen without thinking about listening. So I find it quite difficult to listen to a recording of the Ethometric Museum when they're all going, so I'm pretty sure most of the people who came to see it would probably also find it difficult. However, by immersing them in this narrative experience, they forget about it. They become immersed in it. They become involved in the work. There is, um, as a species, I think humans have long exploited this capacity of light and sound to intensify experience. There's a very nice book called Spaces Speak, Are You Listening? by Barry Blesser and Ruth Salter. And in part of this book, they discuss the acoustic character of ancient sites. And I'll quote just two very short quotes from it. Stephen J. Walker, pioneer of acoustic archaeology, suggested that the Paleolithic art found in caves at Lascaux and Fond de Garme was influenced by the acoustic character of the chambers in which it was created. When the oral experience of an acoustic space is sufficiently strong, its voice contributes, however slightly, to creating an altered state of consciousness in listeners, even modern listeners. By extension, the oral architect who designs a space is also an oral manipulator, a modern day version of an ancient shaman. So when I make work, I am attempting to manipulate my audience, to create the conditions for wonderment. So these last two images that I'm going to show you are from Chorus, which is currently on at the Hub, annoying people. So for me, Chorus has the potential to alter an audience's memory of the space. So we set this up in Newbury Market Square. If people had absolutely no idea what was going on, they would have turned up on Saturday night, going out for a drink with their friends, they would have walked around the corner, and all of a sudden, the marketplace was filled with 14 massive tripods with spinning arms and this kind of strange alien song going on. 
So for me, putting work in a public space so that people will just come across it gives that opportunity that the next time they walk into the market square and it's gone, they think, oh right, that was interesting. Last time I was here, there was this thing going on. So it almost becomes part of a kind of cultural history of that space. And that's all I'm going to say. <laughs> Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and uh, he was a piano player of amazing talent and skill, and I was a very grotty kind of bass player experimenting with percussion. Um, and my work as a musician continued to a point where I started to play a violin, into which I was attaching a sampler, and I was able to use a traditional violin gesture and make music other than a violin. It gave me an extraordinary repertoire of material. And people I know would come to those gigs and they'd say to me afterwards, are you a choreographer? Is the music a product of your gesture on stage? Because playing my violin and doing this, I was actually giving them something to watch. In actual fact, I realized that I was horrified that that's what they thought. I'm like, no, 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 this is the music. I had to get off the stage, I had to sit down, I had to be still, and I needed people to listen. And that actually has been completely what my music has been about um, ever since. That's been, I think, my mission in life on planet Earth, is to in, in get people to actually listen to the wonderful one that came. Yeah, I think it is there, don't worry. Not if it's showing up. Oh, is it? Okay. Yeah. Um, to, to actually invite the human being to step out of our visually driven world and to engage in our ears. Um, my work took me on with my concerts and so on to a situation where I realised that most people that were at my shows were young white men who were largely making the kind of music that I was making. And I realised actually that if I put uh, speakers inside furniture and invited people to sit inside furniture and have this, what ostensibly was noise, move up and down their bodies, then they would love it and queue and come back for more. And old women and children would queue for an hour to have a ride inside an armchair that was playing the recording from the inside of an aeroplane that would be filtered against itself so that it moved up and down and gave you a gorgeous massage up and down your back. Well, I hope that you've all had a chance to go to Unit 99 next to TK Maxx in the shopping centre and get in one of the sonic beds that are having the fortune to be together um, and make and play this work, the Lockshift Songs, which has been a fantastic adventure to make. Firstly, it's the very first piece I've actually made using three sonic beds. The sonic beds developed as a project that I took on in um, 2005 when I made my first sonic bed and realised that actually by putting six subwoofers under a mattress, they're the big bass speakers, and then eight smaller speakers in a panel around a horizontal surface for people to lie in, not only did you have an interesting social question around, okay, well are strangers going to get into bed with each other or not? In other words, we were away from the solo experience of the armchair um, we also had a fantastic space for listening, and people would bang, slip into what Pauline Oliveros' work in America, I don't know if you've come across her work, is called deep listening, this phrase deep listening. And actually, again, in the days when I met Ray and first started to really listen to music, were was listening to um, improvised free jazz, essentially, and suddenly um, there was music that didn't play a tune. It was stuff that went all over the place, and it was full of detail and possible roots here or there, and not necessarily answers, and sounds, and sounds and their textures and the colours and densities and shapes, and the, the landscapes that could be created through working with music in this way became much more important than what I had seen up until that moment as being essentially a linear narrative of a melody and a rhythm. That to me was not music. It was stuff that was played, that was listened to, but actually the stuff that was really happening that was worthwhile listening to was this material that, yes, could be called noise to an awful lot of people. But I think that if it's engaged in, in a way 
that can give people an experience beyond just hearing a tune, which might be a momentary pleasure. The engagement in sound that, that gives a, um, an experience is, I think, can as be as much as life enhancing and healing in all kinds of ways. I think sound affects us in ways that we know is very powerful and actually we don't really know about. And essentially, especially these days, we give ourselves kind of no time for. Um, so uh, the, I suppose this route with the sonic beds has been one of... Sorry. Thanks. Yeah. Has, has been, has, I was actually going to ask about these lights. Has actually been one of um, giving, uh, making instruments that enable people to engage in, to stop, slow down, and to actually engage in deep listening or listening in a way that's very fast. Oh, do I have a couple of other minutes? You certainly do. Okay. Because there's one other thing I want to say, which is about this thing of public space and, and wider audiences. Um, as well as making this sonic furniture, so the Sonic Beds, okay, developed into a project called Music for Bodies. We've made six um, sonic beds around the world, so each one is made in, with materials of a different country. Um, and the other thing that I've been doing is actually wanting to take music outside. How do you, how do you invite people to open their ears in the public space? Because there was me going, oh yeah, it's all very well, all these people coming to my concerts, but they essentially are engaged in this kind of material already. What about the regular people on the street? How do we get this material to them without having for them to come to a specialist concert or an art gallery? Let's put it on the street. I didn't want to put speakers in parks, and I decided that actually I wanted to be quite subtle about it and maybe give people something that would tweak their soundscape as they were going down the road. So I started to work with bicycles bicycles and radios, and I was putting music on bicycles. Um, initially I was using radio, now I'm using a GPS system, whereby there's a bicycle with two speakers on it, and a box on the back with a small computer and an amplifier, and a GPS receiver. And the computer carries a little bit of software so that as you cycle along, the music changes depending on where you go. Now what this does is it actually puts it does several things. It's a, good, it's a lot of good fun for the people that do it. It is, it is actually giving um, the audience member a chance to be a performer because they get on the bicycle and off they pedal with this extraordinary looking bicycle in that it's got a pair of speakers here. And then they go cycling off and dependent on where they go, the music changes. So they'll either follow a specific, a specific route um, or they will find their own way and therefore create their own composition. But they therefore are actually giving the music to the people on the street, and so the passerby becomes audience. So I think the situation uh, of Ray's really beautiful installations in a square that actually create a visual uh, presence which gives something for people to look at. And indeed, the bicycle does this as well, but it's momentary. It's also actually about momentarily going to someone walking down the road. They might hear a trumpet go a bit by them as they are going down the street. And for a moment, they might open their ears, and then their day will change. So it can be as subtle as that as a way of inviting an enhancement or an acknowledgement of the audio perception. I don't know if you can stop there. First of all, I'm delighted to be here in such good company um, and as part of the excellent Milton Keynes International Festival. I work that can be heard during the festival, but I am based in Milton Keynes. Um, I work with sound and I've made a number of works in various public spaces here, so I'm going to talk about a few of my works that have originated or been exhibited here. So for me, Milton Keynes is a bold and pioneering place, a kind of ideological frontier, and as such, it's suitable for experimentation. After moving here from London in 2006, I was very pleased to discover and become active in an experimental arts scene. Over the past five years, Simon Wright and MK Gallery have run a scratch night programme that encourages experimental practice by offering practitioners the use of gallery spaces and a regular audience. 
drawing artists from across the UK as well as further afield in Europe. Many artists, myself included, have benefited from this programme, both in the form of opportunities to air our own works and to experience the work of others. My practice investigates the boundaries between sound and music, silence, signal and noise. I explore sounds that are obscured, silenced, or are often in some way absent, making imperceptible or ignored signals audible through amplification or transformation to acoustic form. I work with microtones, investigating tonal relationships and acoustic phenomena. I'm interested in listening to the natural physical world and the way that sound relates to memory, environment, time and place. My site-specific installations are interventionist works that transform physical space. These often make use of hidden sound sources to alter perception of the space or else to use the space itself as a resonator or a form of meta-instrument. Sound sources I've worked with include oral histories and other hidden voices, text from legal documents, VLF natural radio signals, scientific data on solar and stellar resonances and the orbits of planets. The various places I've chosen to cite these works are a cinema stairwell, a gallery lift, um, an outdoor parabolic dome structure, a planetarium, uh, and the Open University campus. So, um, throughout, I'll talk about three works that I've made here. And the first one, I gathered all the sound of this um, in at Letchley Park Co breaking Centre, not far from here. So, since arriving here, I've become fascinated by the park and I've gathered extensive field recordings. I was one of four artists get granted access to the derelict blocks C and D to document them prior to their renovation. I spent long, li uh, long periods listening and recording the near silence of the blocks that were imbued with so much secrecy and history. Absence is at the heart of Bletchley Park, and I wanted to allow the buildings themselves to speak. So I captured resonances from the empty rooms. I recorded the pigeons that lived within, as well as the sounds that reached the rooms from outside. I dredged hydrophone recordings up from the lake, and in response to the covert communications technologies that were de developed at the park, I gathered electro electromagnetic signals from the air surrounding the blocks. The work of all four artists was exhibited as Station X here in the form of a multi-sensory installation in the project space. Subsequently, the Belletchley Park Trust asked us to loan the works, and they were installed at Allen Turing Hut 8 for around a year. The work also featured on Radio 4's Today programme. At, while making that work, um, I gained my amateur radio licence during evening classes at Bletchley Park because I wanted to learn more about radio propagation and, and about natural radio signals in particular. So last year I made a piece for the gallery uh, for the lift across the square. Um, it's called Earth Loop. Earth Loop allows a visitor tra to travel through a parallel electromagnetic universe as though they have antennas as well as ears. The piece plays with the physical space of the lift journey to provide an escape from man-made harm on the ground. A visitor travels up through the various layers of Earth's atmosphere to reach the ionosphere where the auroral chorus, which is delicately, delicate naturally occurring radio signals, can be heard free from man-made electromagnetic smog. In 2012, I made a work called Five Minute Oscillations of the Sun that used these VLF signals in combination with natural solar resonances. I had discovered the work of the Bison Research Team at the University of Birmingham. The team study natural solar and stellar oscillations, or the sounds of the stars. I got in touch with Bison, and Professor Jill, Bill Chaplin agreed to share research data with me. Five Minute Oscillations of the Sun was an eight-channel work, sited not far from here in the theatre district. It made use of helioseismological data that I had effectively transposed and worked into a composition. It was installed in time for the summer solstice of 2012 and played for seven weeks over the summer, in public space for anyone to come across. Subsequently, I incorporated Bison data into a number of other works, um, a piece commissioned by the ICA for Soundworks, as well as Space Man, an episode of Between the Years for BBC Radio 3. I'm currently a legal human artist in residence with Bison in the School of Physics and Astronomy at the University of Birmingham. The team are part of the NASA KET Commission, and I have the opportunity of spending this year in close collaboration with the scientists. I'll come to my, the last work I'm going to speak about. Uh, last year, I was commissioned by the Open University, to make the England Commission for the University of the Air project, which was a project to commemorate 50 years since Harold Wilson's University of the Air speech, which first announced the idea of the university that would reach out to all. Um, I made On Air, which was a large-scale multi-channel sound work that spread throughout the grounds of the OU campus. With over 100 speakers hidden in the bushes, trees and walkways, 
The work formed an acoustic layer of thought, voices, knowledge and inquiry that permeated the site, presenting the history and output of the Open University, literally floating on the air currents throughout the campus. I wanted to transform the site without visual trace, electrifying or bringing the air to life as though a visitor was able to access an additional sensory channel of thoughts and ideas. The work played with the physical space of the campus, reintroducing sounds from the past, making audible, usually imperceptible imperceptible signals, such as the bats that inhabit the site, and exploding the archive into the space from which it had generated. So in summary, the way that I've learned to understand the world through sound and near silence is through active listening and the pursuit of signals in a realm beyond the audible. By listening to the natural physical world, I've learned more about it and been inspired to consider my place within it. I use sound not only to understand, but to describe the world around me through sensory experiences that may offer new ways to listen. Thanks for listening. everybody, it's lovely to be here, and my name is George Revel, I'm a cultural geographer, uh, and I work at the Open University, and I've written about sound, music, landscape, environment and place for a long time now, um, but I've become increasingly interested in the way in which sa- sound is a medium in itself, uh, more recently, uh, so when I've worked on to particular composers and things, I'm now not just in sound as a medium. Currently developing a project which is, has strange resonances with the kind of things people are talking about here, called listening to climate change. And the idea is to use the temporal qualities of sound, the fact that sound can show through its rhythmic qualities various sorts of duration, short, long, and the complex interplay between those, as a way of using that temporal quality to see how we can bring together the problems of the human scale, time of climate change, and the sort of environmental geological scale of it. So that's part of it. And of course the second thing is that, and again, fascinating here what people are saying here, is how can we use various sorts of found sounds, environmental sounds, Data sonification, which is where you take bits of scientific data and make that into um, a sonic form. Um, perhaps you've been working on that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, material from uh, evidence, vox pop, oral testimony, etc., and mix this all together in such a way that it's possible to see how these things can speak together. There's a quite famous in social science, philosopher of science and society called Bruno Latour, and he has this idea of a parliament of things. What would happen if you could bring animals, environments, uh, plants and things into political debate? So how can you create a shared political space? And it is possible that sound might just be a way of finding something commensurable between all these apparently disparate realms of the environmental and the human. We'll see how it goes. I don't know if it's going to work or not yet, but it's worth a try. Um, sounds, what can sound do in terms of art and place? Well, here are four things that I think sound is good at in relation to place. I'll do this very quickly. So the first one is immersion for me. Sounds provide experience of being surrounded by and enveloped by sound because they affect us deeply and directly. It's in the nature of hearing to be open, relatively passive, 365 degree receptivity. It's impossible to close sound out. Sound also experiences vibration, which is an important part of pace work. And that intimacy of touch is so important in making sound a very distinctive uh, means of uh, expression. Um, It's... uh, (coughs) 
It's interesting, actually, in watching the Vox Pop of your uh, work at Chorus at Newbury, how many people are saying it takes them out of themselves, it transforms them somewhere else. They're immersed in the sound and it carries them away. The second thing, which sound does very well, is connection, in my opinion. So it's in the nature of the sound to move, to reverberate and echo. And as it does so, it connects its sources with spatially and temporally distant people and places. And sometimes, of course, that's temporally different, dis distant in, in, in the extent to which we have recorded sound, we take it somewhere else, we play it again, and it remakes something which has been lost. So sometimes uh, it, it's, uh, it, we have dislocated voices speaking into the future as well as lying round the corner or over the hill. And that's just something which I think is important to in Lockshift songs, where it's carrying something from somewhere else and then giving people that intimate experience in the bed. You can't have anything more intimate than being in a bed, and the vibration of that through that forms that sense of connection. The third thing I think sound does very well is it provides location, or gives location. Sound colours, transforms, articulates and dramatises the experience of place, as any MP3 wearer knows when they walk through the city. It's a sense of sound becoming the soundtrack to places and landscapes. Um, I, read, I was involved with a group called the Landscape Quartet, um, who were environmental artists. They did a residency up at Allen Heads, um, up in the Upper Pennines. They brought their artworks back to Newcastle University and they put them in the music department, which is just wonderful old uh, Victorian stone building sponsored by the Armstrongs, who are big industrialists, great big grandiose place. And it transformed this grand space into something entirely different through uh, work <coughs> using Aeolian, Aeolian flutes and uh, responding to Aeolian flutes using staircase well, or even the guy who was working, um, taking violins, putting microphones in the violins, floating them down streams, and then playing this back and responding to it on the violin in the music room, which wonderful oak panelled room, and here he is destroying violins in the stream. So it subverted and transformed the place in the most wonderful and unexpected kind of ways. The last thing um, is temporality, and I've already alluded to that in telling you about my own work. So in a very particular sense, sound exists only in the duration of its experience. It is inherently a temporal medium. The fusion and juxtaposition of sounds can bring together multiple rhythms and temporalities. Um, but also, by doing that, it also makes it polyvocal too. So the sound world is inherently complex. The physical properties of sound are important because where light waves mask each other, becoming opaque on surfaces, sound waves constantly collide and combine in space. As uh, Jonathan Rhee says, uh, that results in the fact that sound has a special kind of complexity, and as the sound artist Brandon LaBelle says, sounds locate us with an extremely animate and energetic environment that, like auditory phenomenon, often exceeds conventional parameters and possibilities of representation. It's complex, it's conflictual, because it's all there at the same time. If we listen hard enough, we can hear it. They call it the uh, cocktail party effect, don't they? You're listening to something and you can tune in to that bit. But it's always all there. Uh, how are we doing for time? A few minutes, just minutes. Um, so the question remains, um, okay, having thought about uh, sound and place, what about learning to listen differently, which is the other part of the thing we've been told to talk about? Well, there are, of course, and have been for some time, uh, projects dedicated to teaching people how to learn to listen. Murray Schaefer, R. Murray Schaefer, um, Canadian composer, writer, academic, has been working or was working on this from the 1960s onwards. His work is continued with the legacy of the World Forum for Acoustic Ecology. Now their work, his work in particular, um, posited the world as a descent from hi-fi world of bird songs, church bells, nice things, to a lo-fi world of air conditioning units, car horns, stereos, central heating systems, etc. 
The problem with that is, for me, and for a lot of other people, I think, is that that creates a whole set of value judgments about who we are and how we listen. You know, if I ask, you know, went into the local school and asked a 14-year-old teenager if they'd rather listen to uh, their MP3 player or to a nice church bell, I would be given a particular answer. Okay? What people like and what people think is noise, sound, changes. Part of what we're talking about. The history of, um, the cultural history of listening suggests that what people hear and how they hear it does change and has changed over time. It changes quite radically. So we can't just assume that. Um, I think that um, <clears throat> sound seems to be at once kind of the most contradictory of uh, medium because it's the most abstract and the most context dependent of communicative medium, I think. It requires both something or someone to initiate the sound, making process, a suitable medium to carry the sound, its physical vibration, and indeed active sensing and decoding and listening. So you have to have production, transmission, and listening to make sound. The thinginess of sound is co-produced in the relationships between all these things, and without all parts of them being present. It isn't sound, I don't think. It's merely physical vibration, transmitted signal, or background noise. So, for instance, if sound and listening is so dependent on, on this, um, you, there's a wonderful quote from the neurologist Oliver Sacks, which you may have heard, okay, which is, he had patients with Parkinson's disease, and he wanted them, they found a way of getting music to help them with Parkinson's disease. But just any old music just didn't do it. It had to be music which meant something in the lives of these people which happened to be big band music of the 30s and 40s, because that was the music they could tune into. They couldn't have done it if it was, you know, 60s pop or 18th century uh, viola de gamba music. It had to be something very specific. And in that context, I end up really, in my presentation, with two questions. And so, if we are to get people to listen, and if we are to locate our sound works in place, the two questions for me are, firstly, how can we engage people? Because it's our duty as teachers, as creators, to go out and try and meet people halfway, partway, somewhere, find something that they can latch onto. And I find in all the works that I'm listening to here precisely that. And the second question, which is the very academic kind of question, is what is it? How do we want people to change their listening? What is it that's wrong with their listening now, and what would we like it to be? We need to be much more reflexive and critical about that changing listening, because simply taking things for granted and saying, well, listening was better then, it's not so good now, doesn't do it, because it excludes so many of us. It's all right for me, being you know, a white middle-class person who loves Cathedral Evensong, but for a lot of people, that notion of hi-fi just doesn't cut the mustard. And I think that I'll say thank you. Right, so we're left with an image of even some cutting or not cutting mustard, which is, I think, an interesting mix of uh, metaphors. Um, that's great. I mean, thank you for all of those. those are, that, that, was, that was fascinating. And uh, lots of different things buzzing in my head. But what I Want to want to do is to allow all of you to make contributions, to ask questions. I'm not sure whether it's going to turn into asking questions and people answering, or whether we'll have a whether it will become a, a wider sort of set of dialogues, discussions, of presentations of ideas. But I'm just going to first of all just open it up to whoever wants to say something, to ask something, to contribute something. Okay. Well, can I ask a question to the two ladies because? Um, both of you worked, I think, with the work with record sounds recorded in the environment as inspiration, which you then took to I believe, the studio or something and transformed in different ways into your constructions. And my question is, 
I, 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 the one I'm familiar with is, is the Sonic Bed, you know, the sort of best. Mm. Uh, by the time you've finished, is it so divorced from the original recording or you know, the movement of the sun or whatever that it's, it's almost entirely the product of your artist's imagination as opposed to having anything left of the original sound that you recorded? Do you want to answer that first, Carl? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I'll talk um, maybe about the Bletchley Park project specifically because that was taking the sound very specifically from one empty environment where it belonged, where, where it spoke, <coughs> and taking it to a completely different environment, a very controlled environment. And I found it a really a very compelling experience to hear it again in the other space. It's almost like I could hear it better, in a way, once it was taken somewhere else and in a different context. So, um, I suppose it depends how much you are altering sounds as well, and, and that's something, I, I guess, within a work like that, I'd, I'd be looking for the, the rhythms and the tones and things that are inherent within the space, and then retaining those within the work to speak of the space. So, uh, in a work like that in particular, I don't think the actual sounds were so radically altered that for me they didn't speak of the old place anymore. They spoke of the old place in a new place. Um, that's a very interesting question to have to answer right now uh, in terms of where I am with my practice because when I mentioned starting with a violin and what I was doing in the mid-90s, my use of recordings was very much about being in the live situation because I started a concert with no sound and I would have a microphone outside and then one on the violin and I would actually be playing and processing the violin sound into something other than the violin because I didn't like it, mm. I realised several years later. But also I was then bringing in sound from outside because I wanted us to go, hold on a moment, what is also happening at this moment? Outside. Oh, this is happening at this moment. Let's listen to this for a moment. And then I bang this back into the abstract world of what I was doing with the violin. So actually, at that time, no, I would take the sound. I mean, the reason for using the sound was largely as a source material to transform it into something else. Um, then I, I actually didn't... It's interesting because people think I've always worked with field recordings, and I, I kind of haven't um, in as much as... I have always processed acoustic material and made electronic digital material from it. So um, I'm an electroacoustic musician, I suppose, more than an electronic one. Um, but actually, more recently, um, I have started to use field recordings in my work as much as anything because suddenly the equipment was available again to be able to get really good quality stuff. Like originally, I was using DAT before, and then DAT disappeared, and mini disc was vile, and then portable disc recorders and all this kind of thing. So I left it aside for a long time. But it was three years ago and I was working, actually, this is when Caroline and I met, I was working on a project in the, in the Galloway Forest in Scotland and uh, making lots and lots of recordings in the forest. And I was sonifying data from, um, from the planets to be able to make music. And the music that I was making was completely electronic. It was totally synthesised using data and beside it, I was placing it, if you like, within the context of the forest, which was these gorgeous recordings. And there were songs in there as well, and there was an album. But ultimately, it was a, it was a, a situation where I ended up going, I'm not really very happy with putting, recording, with putting place in a recording, because nothing replaces the experience of being there. And I would rather encourage people to go to the place and engage in the sound of being there. Um, in the case of the Lockshift songs, <clears throat> as I've said already, this has been a new experience. And um, putting the recordings that I made from the canal, from when I walked all the way up the canal inside the bed, I did very much want to use, for those of you who've heard it, there are moments when it is absolutely definitely, you know, there's a canal and then there's this engine that's underneath you. And I didn't want to interfere with those recordings because I wanted to give people an under, you know, unquestionable sense of where it had all come from, and the actual location of the material was part of that. And it was also to do with the fact that somehow those beds stand up in that space like individual boats or something. They are their own presence within that, and there is this journey that happens between them 
with the with the with the piece. I don't know if I've answered your question, but that's essentially what I'm doing. So I'm kind of doing both. I'm doing both. Yeah. Okay. Other other questions, contributions. Uh, a lot of things have come up today, which I just found very fascinating. One of the things that hasn't come up is this kind of whole notion of decolonialization. And I think that as a, a, an audience, um, mm. as just an appreciator over years of different work, including your own, um, you know, I, I, I'm awkward, I have my routines, and I don't really like to be put out of in lots of aspects of my life. But when somebody succeeds in doing that to me, by what they do, then that is a kind of, you know, it, it, it's this kind of a deep learning thing that goes on. And it's something that it does transform you in some way. It's very difficult. I'm, I'm talking about it at a very conceptual level, I know. But that's what I would say is that something within me changes. And I don't, you know, from the, from the experience of hearing something. And sometimes, years later, I can sort of hear that again or whatever. But also the space is different. And, you know, so that, that taking an awkward customer, I probably am, as a familiar, which I want to actually be in most of the time, there are many things which we do in life which actually we don't want to be deterred from doing. And anybody that achieves that growth, um, it, it, it just, you know, it is transformative in some way, just an audience members. So, I want to raise that. Well, I was at the station concourse yesterday with the chorus, which was <coughs> absolutely fascinating. It was right on the main concourse. You come out, there it is, spinning around, making its noise. And this, well, when I go and catch a train, I'm very um, uni-focused. I want to catch my train. If I've got the timing right, I can get a coffee and catch the train. <laughs> so... I thought, well, it's going to be really interesting. How are people going to respond? Because if I was an audience member and I was on the way to the train station, I'd be going, uh, uh, what's that thing? I've got to catch my train. So, but I was thinking, how is that going to be different for people going? Is there going to be a change between people who have no idea this thing is happening? They're on their way to catch a train. That's really what they want to do. They don't want to miss the train because they're stressed, they're late, whatever. But if people are coming out, it might be slightly different. But anyway, what happened was, some people walked past it as if it wasn't there, um, looking at their phone, <laughs> without noticing that this thing was there. Fair enough. We have a particular way in this country of being able to do that. I think we're trained from very early in life to be able to walk past things. You know, it's fine. It's not happening. I'll just pretend it's not there and it, everything will be fine. Um, other people were clearly like, ah, oh, God, what's that thing? That looks strange, that looks weird, but I'm going to miss my train. And then other people would be kind of drawn into it. And in a sense, that's all I could hope for, for from the passing trade, for the people who didn't know that it was happening. If I manage to draw, wherever it is I do, if I manage to draw a few people into it, and get them to stay with it, even momentarily, and they, were, they weren't expecting to come across it, but they managed to spend a little bit of time with it, then I'm thrilled. I'm absolutely delighted. And I do get people coming up to me who just come across it and they just get stuck. It's the kind of work that if you, you know, you go and you see it, you think, oh, right, things spinning around, making a noise, and you go off. But if you spend a bit of time with it, it starts to suck you in. You start getting trapped in it. And so sometimes that happens to people. They get a bit trapped. And then they don't quite know why they've been trapped. And then they just sort of stood there. And they, they might come up to me and say, oh, what is this? How you know what? And I'm always really, really excited when people who weren't expecting to come across something like that get engaged, get involved in it. Because that's, for me, then the work has done its work. Do you, um, you mentioned several times when you were talking about earlier pieces you're using the word narrative, like your pieces always have a narrative. Are you engaged and interested in using narrative because that is a way of engaging, getting, encouraging an audience? To yeah, the absolutely. Story? Narrative for me is absolutely essential. I mean, sound mm. is time based, sound takes you on a journey. Mm. One of the reasons, one of the works I showed you, Siren, mm. spinning things but indoors, um, that was always shown as um, a performance. 
you arrive at the beginning, it starts. It takes you on a journey. It's a relatively straightforward journey, but it is a composition. It builds, goes along, comes down again. If it was um, a continuous installation, I have done it like that once, you might walk into the art gallery, you might think, oh, that's interesting, spinning things. Yeah, I've seen that, I'll go now. I think, for me, narrative is um, a way of trying to engage people, trying to make people stay with it. So, you, in a way, you're telling them a story. I mean, yes, it's a musical story. It starts slowly, it gradually builds up, it, gets, it reaches a certain intensity. If I do the things indoors, I change light levels. I try and keep something just shifting all the way to hold people with it, because I think if you do that, the work has more chance of affecting people, of getting the effect that I want from it. That, to get it. But you, both of Carol and Kat, both of you also seem to me to be doing things in particular in public space, which is to disrupt the familiar or use the familiar or rework the familiar or something. Is that, is that a wrong? Well, I don't think I'm out to disrupt the familiar. I think I'm just in, in, enticing, hoping, inspiring, inviting, setting up a situation for people to be able to engage in, in the work in some way, even if it's only on a subliminal level, just to be able to give them a, some kind of listening experience. So my relation with sight is always quite different because invariably I'm making instruments that will take people through the sight, actually. Um, can I come back on this thing on narrative, though? Can we, can we discuss the narrative a bit? No, it's, uh, simply because this, the, the Lockshift Songs is the first, first piece I've made that actually has a narrative. Because I have been, not anti-narrative, but I haven't used narrative at all in my work because I am actually, uh, I, I feel that narrative can give an answer to people and it doesn't mean that they are necessarily going to find their own way through the work. I suppose what I'm saying is, I don't have an answer. I'm not saying that this is the work. I'm more like setting up a situation which I invite people into, inviting them to find their own journey, their own narrative through the piece, if you like. Um, which I have believed is going to create um, this other kind of listening, a deeper listening, which I think... Maybe it's to do with how my own inquiry into music has been, which has been completely anti-melody, anti-narrative, anti-knowing what was going to happen. More like dismissing those things and wanting to engage um, in another level, I suppose, in another, in another way of experiencing sound through the things that I mentioned earlier, colour, texture, rhythm, unknowns. Um, and inviting a completely other kind of experience, which is probably very totally unfamiliar. Which is maybe why things like sonic birds are useful, because people are comfortable and then they are, you know, they're ripe fruit for anything. But, 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 but they're not just comfortable, they're vulnerable. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And there's no openness there. Yes, well, it, and it, it also is a language that speaks to everyone on any of any culture and any kind of background. You don't have to say to someone, you need to do this. It's more like, actually, Bert tells you to, or invites you to lie down. 